Last week, we saw political chaos in Washington, D.C. as an angry mob attempted a coup against the government. What's behind all of this turmoil? Well, ultimately, the economy is in the toilet, except for the stock market. But the point is that the economy relies on natural resources. And limits to growth not only affects our economic system, at this point, it affects our political system as well. Why isn't limits to growth obvious? Limits to growth should be a simple idea, but somehow it's not. Limits to growth should be common sense. We live on a finite planet with finite resources. Everywhere we see scientists complaining about the destruction of the environment. What's the problem here? I want to look a little more deeply at this problem by looking at the question, if there are limits to growth, then why is the economy growing? I think that by looking at this question, we can see some of the problems associated with getting people to recognize and to act on the problem of limits to economic growth. It seems to be clear that our agricultural economy, at least, is unsustainable. First of all, we've got an extinction crisis because humans and their livestock are overrunning the planet. There's no place else for wild animals to go. We've also upset the global carbon cycle by chopping down all the forests and turning them into agricultural lands, and that's contributed to global warming. And finally, we've got soil erosion. We're eroding soil at a rate 10 to 20 times faster than the natural rate of soil formation. So it's clearly not sustainable, and yet here we are. Global meat consumption actually quadrupled between 1961 and 2018. So that raises the question, if there are limits to growth of the agricultural economy, then why is it going up? Why is meat production increasing? It looks like there are no limits, or at least the limits must be somewhere in the future. In fact, you could say the same thing about the economy as a whole. Right around the first Earth Day on April 22nd, 1970, there was a huge upsurge of interest in the environment, and there were a number of million copy bestsellers published during this time. In 1968, we had Paul Ehrlich and the population bomb. Ehrlich argued that if we continued to grow our population, we weren't going to be able to feed all these people. Nevertheless, since the publication of this book in 1968, population, human population has doubled. Then there's the Environmental Handbook. This is the book that was actually published for the first Earth Day on April 22, 1970. On the back of this book, it says, 1970s, the last chance for a future that makes ecological sense. The crisis of the environment cannot wait another decade for answers. Well, it's been five decades now, and we're still waiting for answers. Then we've got Diet for a Small Planet by Francis Moore LaPay. LaPay argued that our livestock agriculture system was hugely wasteful and that it was essentially a protein factory in reverse. And she advocated a more plant-based diet, and she even had some recipes in the back. Nevertheless, since the publication of this book in 1971, meat production has more than tripled. And finally, and finally we have the book The Limits to Growth, published in 1972. This book argued that there were inherent limits on economic growth, and that sometime in the 21st century we would start to encounter real problems and that the economy would start to decline. Well, the middle of the 21st century, that would be about right now. But in any event, since 1972, we've seen nothing but economic growth. So all of these books argued that we need to be very concerned about various environmental issues. And in fact, these were not the only warnings that we've seen in the last 50 years. 
1992, there was a World Scientist Warning to Humanity that was signed by over 1,700 leading scientists. Then, in 2017, there was a 25-year update, and 15,364 scientists signed the World Scientist Warning to Humanity a second notice. And in this document, they argued for drastic reductions in fossil fuel consumption and in meat consumption. So we can see that we've had plenty of warnings over the past 50 years about unsustainable things, and yet we continue to do them. So if there are limits to growth, then why is the economy growing? I'm sure that some people would say that this means that there aren't limits to growth or that we haven't encountered them yet. I think the explanation is a little more simple, and that is that just because something is unsustainable doesn't mean that you can't do it anyway. Suppose, for example, that I'm 25 years old and I win the lottery and I get $10 million and I decide to live a life of luxury. I'm going to spend $2 million a year. Well, anyone can see that that's not sustainable. After five years, all my money is going to be gone. And then I'm going to have to get a job. I'm going to have to move in with my parents. Or I'm going to be out on the street. That doesn't mean that you couldn't spend your money at this rate anyway. And I'm sure that some unfortunate lottery winners actually spend their money in this way. The same thing is true for the environment. Just because something is unsustainable doesn't mean that you can't do it anyway. The important thing to notice here is that when you start doing something unsustainable, there's no big bang, there's no crisis, there's no economic depression, there's no mobs of people out in the street trying to overthrow the government. That comes later. But at the time, there's no particular consequences for doing something that's unsustainable. And that's, I think, part of our problem right there. I think we can get some insight into this problem by looking at what the ecological economists call the contrast between an empty world and a full world. What the world is full of, or empty of, is human beings and the human-created infrastructure, such as cities, roads, houses, cropland, livestock, computers, cars, food, and pollution. So a relatively empty world is a world which perhaps existed 500 years ago, 1,000 years ago, in which the human economy is relatively small in relationship to the total environment. A full world is a world like that of today, in which humans occupy a huge amount of area. The economy today is over a hundred times greater than it was at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. This focuses attention on the real crux of the problem, namely that the economy is part of the larger environment which it occupies. This should be common sense, although it's not always clear to economists. So where are we going with this? I think that some people will suspect at this point, even if they're too polite to suggest it, that all I'm trying to do is say, well, we're destroying the environment, and therefore we're doomed, and we might as well crawl into a car corner and die. That's not where I'm going at all. There are things we can do about this. If the economy is too big because we've overshot the limits to growth, then what's the answer? A smaller economy. And that's the th direction we need to go in. And a smaller economy isn't that unimaginable a thing. And there's one way you could easily get to a smaller economy, and that is through a plant-based agriculture. If we had a plant-based agriculture, that would immediately free up about three-quarters of all the agricultural land on the planet. That's huge. That would have an immediate impact on deforestation, on mass extinctions, and even on global warming. In fact, there's no way that we can really deal with any of these problems without a plant-based agriculture. Now, that doesn't mean that that's going to solve all of our problems. 
It's more complicated than just saying, go vegan for the planet, and then everybody goes vegan, and then problem solved. If we continue burning coal, if we continue overpopulating the planet, if we continue driving cars, going vegan will just sort of slow things down for a while. But we'll still eventually get over the limits to growth and we'll have the same problem that we have today. What we need to understand is the economy is part of the environment, not vice versa. The real question is, why are we doing all of these unsustainable things? Why don't we just say, okay, there are limits to growth. What are they and what can we do about them? We started out with the problem, why isn't limits to growth obvious to economists and to our political leaders? And I think we've identified a key problem. When you start doing something unsustainable, there's no obvious economic signal. There's no recession. There's no big bang to tell you that you're doing something that's crazy and unsustainable. Now, there are many things going on in the economy right now. Technology, automation, racism, inequality, all of these things affect the economy. But the underlying basis of the economy is natural resources and the ecosystem on which the economy depends for its very existence. You can't systematically destroy the environment and not expect to see consequences at some point. And for us, that point is now. People can sense when things aren't right with the economy. And when that happens, they become unhappy. And they start looking for more radical solutions. And they can be influenced by demagogues. This is what made the capital takeover first thinkable and then real. The underlying issue with most of our economic, social, and political problems is environmental, and specifically its limits to growth. We've way overshot the limits to growth, and we need to move in the direction of degrowth and a smaller economy. Until we recognize this, we're going to continue to see the kind of political chaos that we saw last week in Washington.